Welcome back, Team Awesome. Okay, today we're actually going to talk about Darwin's voyage and his discoveries, exactly what led to what we now know as the theory of natural selection. So let's start talking. It started out, he took a trip on the HMS Beagle. But let's talk a little bit about what Darwin's background entailed in the first place. We know that Darwin was from 19th century England. And at the time, religion and politics were tightly intertwined. And there was, as I've alluded to before, every time you have a European nobility and monarchy, there's always some of that. Well, that led to part of what Darwin's issue was with actually publishing. A couple of interesting things happened that postponed the publishing of him doing this, and all of it is from within Darwin's own discomfort with exactly how to publish it and not be a social pariah. He he started in London dealing with or working with a lot of people who were learned scientists. They called themselves at the time naturalists because they were trying to understand exactly how the natural world works. And from this is where a lot of our sciences, the natural sciences, come from. Darwin's idea originally was to travel around the world and collect a lot of things so that in that sort of highbrow um, community, there would be a lot of, well, let's consult the Darwin collection and decide whether or not the, you know, snapping turtles of South America are indeed the same as the snapping turtles in South Africa. I don't know. So this was his idea. It didn't pan out that way, but it actually worked out in his favor. This is Darwin. This is about the time he published his manuscript, which was known as On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. And we'll talk about that book in just a minute, but the biggest thing to really discuss here is what took him so long. And as I mentioned, Darwin was, uh, his close relations were uh, associated with the church. His father was a clergyman. And he had a lot of other social reasons that he was hesitant to produce this work. In fact, his work is not anywhere near as controversial as people give it credit to be. Uh, he never mentioned humans throughout the entire uh, treatise. In fact, it wasn't until much later that somebody did start talking about the place of humans within the hierarchy of animals in the animal kingdom. In it, all he was doing was addressing the change amongst species. If you see two closely related species that are slightly different, he supposed that they were somehow related. And why that change happens is really the principle of what he's talking about. The book in question is this, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, and I love it because, as any long-winded 19th century Englishman goes, they always have a subtitle. So here it is. Or, the preservation of favored races by races, he actually meant species or types, maybe I guess a better term for it would be like breeds, in the struggle for life. Now, let's think about exactly what he's saying in this subtitle really describes what the book is actually about preservation of favored breeds in the struggle for life is everybody going to survive the struggle for life no some are going to be favored over others and they will be preserved what he's saying is if all other things being equal to closely related animals or organisms, really, if one of them has a slight advantage, they are likely to live longer, have more babies, and over time, their traits are going to be the most popular within that community. In other words, the frequency of a, a trait that is advantageous will go way up over time in a population because 
if they're competing for resources with someone with another group that does not have that advantage over time that advantage will be sought out the frequency will go up within that population that should be fairly self-evident and it, if it's not don't worry about it we'll walk through this a fair amount and we'll have plenty of time to talk about questions at the end of this week so Darwin's whole point of this, which, by the way, was finally released in 1859. Now, his voyage on the Beagle took place around the 1830s. The question is, why did it take him so long to publish this manuscript? And as I alluded to before, he was sort of afraid to do it. It wasn't until some other people came along that helped him do it. And we'll talk about them in uh, a subsequent uh, talk. Here it is, the Beagle. This was his ship that, well, it, it wasn't his ship. It was the ship upon which he uh, chartered a voyage. He also, as per his original idea, he booked a bunch of hull space in there to keep his collection. Some of his collection actually just recently died. In 2009, Darwin's tortoise, his pet tortoise that belonged to Charles Darwin in the 1850s, died in 2009. They're a long-lived species. Well, the Beagle was ostensibly a research vessel. It was going around and it was mapping and taking readings, but also, as with any semi-private ship at the time, it was also a trading vessel. And it was going from a known port to another known port trading goods so it was sort of like a floating walmart in a way and most people when it, when the ships came in they got excited because now you can go to market and get stuff that you can't normally get well where did they go they went literally everywhere they started not surprisingly up here in the british isles took off came down past the canary canary islands into the west coast of Africa bounced across to the east coast of South America down around Cape Horn which is a very dangerous passage by the way still very dangerous came up and around and if you associate Darwin with anything in his big aha moment it happened right here off the coast of South America in the Galapagos Islands and there's probably one or two animals that you associate Darwin most closely with, if you know much about Darwin. First, let's talk about those actual islands. The Galapagos Islands, which are right off the west coast of South America, are obviously, you can tell by just looking at them, they're volcanic islands, meaning that they're made up by volcanoes. They start at the base of the ocean and build their way up. Well, that's meaningful. Because as such, none of these islands are very far away from each other. By the way, Darwin eventually made it all the way around the planet on a ship. That's pretty impressive. That's hard to do, especially in the 1830s. That was a fairly dangerous voyage, and a lot can go wrong. The Galapagos Islands are going to show us a few very interesting things. And when Darwin got to them, they were inhabited, there were people there. But there was a lot of nature there, too, and that is what gave him his forehead-slapping aha moment. And this is a big deal in science. When you come up with a what seems like a very obvious thing, and all the learned people around you are slapping their foreheads going, why didn't I think of that? That's when you're really onto something. That's when you're into something big. It's going to be a well-known thing. And that's what happened with Darwin when he eventually got pulled out, kicking and screaming, and finally published his big aha moment. This is what Darwin saw. These are, one of his, these are some of his drawings. We're not talking about the person. We're talking about this beast directly in front of us, this guy here. What is that? If your first thought was a turtle, you're wrong. It looks like a turtle. But it's actually living on land. Turtles live in water. Tortoises are land animals. That's an important distinction because 
Do you think, in a voyage all the way around the planet, Darwin would have seen the occasional sea turtle? Of course he did. He then saw tortoises. This wasn't the first time he had heard of them. It was the first time he actually saw them. It does not take a huge leap to realize turtles and tortoises are closely related. However, here's where it gets exciting. The tortoise has adapted to life on land. The tortoise adapted to life on land by getting feet instead of flippers, getting a long neck so he can eat the food that's up at the tops of these delicious little brambles. So it's got a long neck. It's got feet instead of flippers, and it's also got a much higher arched, rougher shell because it doesn't have to swim through the water anymore. It doesn't have to be hydrodynamic to slip through the water. So the tortoise was his first moment of, hmm, this could be a thing. But what really took it home, and if you do associate Darwin with any animal, it's likely to be this, the finch. Darwin's finches. Now, Darwin had seen finches before. Finches actually exist in most parts of Europe and in a lot of places around the world. But what was striking about the finches on the Galapagos, which, by the way, remember, are very close islands. They're not very big islands either. And many of these different breeds of finch lived on the same island. These, by the way, are natural breeds, not what we do with dogs. So the first finch that Darwin noticed was this thick-beaked finch that's eating these brambles and nettles. Then he saw another finch with obviously completely different pelage color, but it has a much tinier beak, and it's living down on the volcanic beaches area. And it's eating, it's got a tiny little beak because it's reaching into all these volcanic pores in the volcanic rock and pulling out bugs and eating bugs. Yet another finch from closer toward the middle of the islands. This one has a massive beak and is eating nuts and seeds. Huge crunching beak. Yet another one down there on the beaches. This one is similar to our sandpiper here in Southern California. They run out onto the sand and use that thin little needle-like beak to reach in and pull bugs out of the sand. What does all this mean? Well, for Darwin, these are some of his drawings. He realized, do you know, these finches live so close to one another, and they could probably interbreed with one another. But unlike Lamarck, Darwin knew about mutation. So Darwin realized that finch number one here, with the thick, heavy, nut-cracking beak, probably was originally a mutation from other finches that had this big, heavy beak, and it realized it could use that big, heavy beak to eat things like seeds and nuts that these other smaller beaks cannot eat. So what do you think number one, big, heavy beak, is going to look for in a mate? A big, heavy beak. So their offspring has a big, heavy beak. And you see how this goes on and on and on. So now you have a population of these heavy-beaked finches. Conversely, number four down there, or number three, are going to do the same thing, but in their own kind. So even though these finches could interbreed if they wanted to, and they were certainly close enough to do so, because all of the Galapagos Islands aren't much more than a few miles apart. So if these guys wanted to fly a couple of miles and interbreed, they could, but they don't. And that's because they have an advantage for their given area. And they don't want to give that up by interbreeding and losing that advantage. That advantage likely began with a mutation. We'll talk a lot more about these things later on and where Darwin's ideas came from, we already talked about, but where they're going to go and what they evolved, pardon the pun, into. By the way, did Darwin invent the term evolved or evolution? Absolutely not. Uh, that term has been around for hundreds of years before Darwin, and literally all it means, evolution, means change. Evolution means any sort of change. Your car evolves over time because it starts to break down. Your house changes over time because you make changes, you upgrade, you downgrade, things break down, etc., etc. You 
paint it a different color. Evolution doesn't mean anything other than that. So if you see change in the world, it's evolution. But this form of evolution is different because now we're talking about gene frequencies within a population, which we'll talk a lot more about in the subsequent videos.